Welcome to another lively edition of the Deadly Experiment, ladies and gentlemen. Rick Adams, your host and producer for the program, and also seen on YouTube. We are Rick Adams Uncensored. New subscribers every week to our channel on YouTube. Also, many, many hundreds of hits on our various programs. We have a number of the video programs of these programs aired locally on public access television, but also we do have the audios of many of my radio broadcasts on the Republic Broadcasting Network, and that's republicbroadcasting.org, which I do a weekly program. So we are indeed busy beavers, and we are uh, trying to, uh, in these last days, get people prepared psychologically in their hearts for what is to befall us in these days that Jesus described as the generation of the bad fig tree. The generation described in the book of Matthew, particularly Matthew 24. This would be that generation of time. So folks, we are looking at the 70 years generation from 1948 when the, the bad fig tree was planted and recognized. Uh, Jesus described it as a cursed tree, a tree of evil that would represent Satan and his children in these last days, establishing their worldwide Babylonian captivity for the entire globe. First time ever the Kenites, the sons of Cain, would have their own state, their own entity in this age that we live in, from the first world age to the second world age. First time ever. And that entity will be the entity that Jesus says he will destroy upon his second advent. There will be no stone unturned upon another, no wall of wailing, though there will be much wailing and certainly there will be many bursting into tears as they find out their fate is not what they thought. And those are the sons of Cain, Jesus described as the role players, the actors. The word is translated hypocrites in the King James Version of the Bible. Who are his children and who are not his children? Who are the murderers of Christ? Who murdered Jesus at this time of year? We look at Passover. That is, Passover is for Christians. Passover is for the same people who came out of bondage in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12, we read about it. And the same people today who, through the blood of Jesus, the Passover lamb, are saved through that blood of the lamb Christ himself. Christ means the anointed one. Yeshua Messiah is God's Savior, and he was that Passover lamb. Today, Christians are doing the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. They're following the sons of Cain, except the sons of Cain have our holy days, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Nissan, and the Passover is for Christians. And Christian churches should be celebrating the Passover. Amen? Amen, he says. All right, I can hear him out there. Folks, they're not doing it. Most of your churches are worshiping Easter bunnies. I mean, they're, they're looking for little chocolate bunnies for the kids. They're planting Easter eggs. And all of this is an abomination unto God, I have to tell you. He says that it's paganism. It has nothing to do with the risen Christ or the crucifixion of Messiah. But today on this program, you will get the historicity of who was responsible for the false trial and false conviction of Jesus Christ. Both the Jews, as they are called, the sons of Cain in reality, and the Roman government, who was led to do the dirty work for the synagogue of Satan, even as we are led today, America, to do the fighting and waging the wars of aggression against Islam and against other nations, Arabic nations, that just happen to be on the hit list of the state of Israeli. So folks, nothing changes. There's nothing new under the sun, the Bible says. And Dr. Compare is a scholar 
who Dr. Bertrand Compare, a scholar, a legal scholar as well as a Bible scholar, who brings us this message today from the Word of God, the Old to the New Covenant, as to who and what Jesus was and how we are celebrating his Passover lamb, he, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. And now, let's study and listen very carefully to this Bible exposition. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Herald of Truth broadcast is on the air, a program of spirit and truth dedicated to teaching the way of God more perfectly. These broadcasts contain keys to help unlock knowledge and reveal hidden truths of the Bible in these last days. Christians called to a higher level of understanding will be given Bible-based solutions to their personal as well as national problems. They will want to find out more about their part in God's plan. Our mailing address is Kingdom Identity Ministries, Post Office Box 1021, Harrison, Arkansas, 72602, and will be given again at the end of this broadcast. This is Bertrand L. Compare, and I want to talk to you about some things pertaining to our Savior, Jesus Christ. First of all, I want to talk to you about the trials at which he was wrongfully condemned and show you that his trials actually proved him innocent. At this season of the year, when we're celebrating the crucifixion and resurrection of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and his gift of the Spirit to his disciples, it might be well to carefully review the events on which our faith is based. The penalty of sin is death. And we are saved from this penalty because Jesus Christ could pay it for us, since he had no sin of his own to pay for, but died only for us. The Jews claim that he was a criminal, crucified in punishment of his own crime. Yet the record shows that he was tried in three courts and found innocent under the law in all three. Let's look at the record. First, the Jewish trial. Jewish law never allowed a man to be tried by a single judge. A court of three judges was the smallest, corresponding to our modern justice of the peace, and could try only very minor cases. But every town of at least 120 families had a minor Sanhedrin, composed of 23 judges. This minor Sanhedrin had general jurisdiction of all serious civil and criminal cases and also served as the tax board, and governed the schools, the highways, the sanitary regulations, and so forth. As the largest city in Palestine, Jerusalem had two minor Sanhedrins. Jerusalem also had the only great Sanhedrin, a court of general civil and criminal jurisdiction. It was composed of 71 judges, there being 23 in the chamber of priests, 23 in the chamber of scribes, 23 in the chamber of elders, and two presiding officers. Lawful court hours began after the morning sacrifice and ended before the evening sacrifice, and no part of any criminal case could be heard outside these hours. After hearing the evidence, each judge gave a brief statement of his view of the case, those judges who favored acquittal speaking first. After the arguments came the voting, at which the youngest judges must vote first, so they would be voting their own honest views and not be overawed by their elders. If the accused was acquitted, he was released at once. Bible and Jewish law both took great care to avoid convicting an innocent man. If the accused was found guilty, the trial was recessed until the next afternoon, so the judges could reconsider the case overnight. And on the second afternoon, each judge must vote and give his reasons for it again. If his reasons differed from those he had used on the first day, his vote could not be counted for conviction. One who had at first voted for conviction could change his vote, but one who had first voted for acquittal could not change. 
At least 37 votes were required to convict, but a conviction by unanimous vote on the first ballot was legally considered to be an acquittal because it was felt that such a conviction must be the result of passion and prejudice. If the second day's hearing also resulted in conviction, sentence was deferred until sunset, and any new arguments could be considered, and if need be, a new vote taken. Because of this requirement of a second day's session, no trial for a capital crime could be lawfully begun on the day before a Sabbath or any holy day. Under both Bible and Jewish law, no man could be condemned on the testimony of only one witness, and each of the two or more witnesses must be able to testify to enough facts to prove the crime. It could not be pieced together out of many incomplete fragments. Only one witness was allowed in the courtroom at any time, so that none could hear what the others said, and if the prosecution's witnesses disagreed, then all were rejected as no man's life could be taken on such uncertain evidence. When a condemned defendant was led away to execution, a herald with a crimson banner led the procession, shouting out the name of the accused and the charge against him, and calling upon anyone who knew any fact concerning the case to speak up. If anyone did so, or if any judge thought of any new argument in favor of the accused, they brought the defendant back and reconsidered his case. The Jewish Talmud also forbade the conviction of anyone of a crime punishable by death or by flogging unless it was proved that just before the commission of the crime he had been warned that what he was about to do was a crime. The only exceptions to this were the crimes of burglary, perjury, and leading others to worship idols. The record shows that Jesus Christ was not tried by a Jewish court competent to convict him. John 18, verses 19 to 24, shows that he was first tried before Caiaphas, the high priest, sitting as a single judge at a private examination without any witnesses a little after midnight. This was illegal in every respect. His next hearing was before the high priest and the great Sanhedrin, but Matthew 26, verses 73 to 75 shows that this was before 3 a.m. Also, it was the day before the holy day, the Passover, so no capital trial could be lawfully begun on that day, not even at a proper hour. These proceedings were therefore totally unlawful and void. The mock trial they held was equally corrupt. Mark 14, verses 55 to 59, shows that the false witnesses they brought against him could not agree on their perjured stories, so there was no lawful evidence against him. Even the high priest recognized this, so they abandoned their first charge, which was in the nature of sedition, that Jesus Christ had said that he would destroy the temple and then rebuild it. They tried him again, craftily, without specifying any charge against him, by asking him if he was really the Christ, the Son of God, to which he truly said, I am. They then declared that this was blasphemy and said, What need have we of witnesses? Under their own law, even if such a statement had been blasphemy, they could not convict without the testimony of two witnesses, either with or without a confession in open court. But it was not blasphemy, for under their own law, Blasphemy consisted only in using vile language toward God, which not even their worst false witness had accused him of. And every Israelite could say that he was the Son of God. For Deuteronomy 14 verse 1 says, Ye are all the children of the Lord your God. And Psalm 82 says, All of you are children of the Most High. So this charge also was false. And while they condemned him on it, they abandoned this also as false and unproved when they brought him before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. While the great Sanhedrin met again just after daylight, both Matthew 27, verse 1, and Mark 15, verse 1, shows that this was not to hold a trial, but only a strategy meeting to plan how to get the Romans to commit their murder for them. 
Early in the morning, soon after dawn, they brought Jesus Christ before the Roman governor with their new accusations. Again, this was just a judicial lynching. Remember that even if the trial had been lawfully begun after this time, a conviction would require that it recess until the afternoon of the next day for reconsideration. And if the second day's trial again resulted in conviction, sentence would be deferred until sunset, so that the third day would be the shortest time in which a legal execution could be held. Yet they were rushing their judicial murder through on the first day. The record shows that after the Jews brought Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate, Pilate held the Roman trial, then sent Jesus Christ away to another part of the city where Herod was staying. Herod held another trial, then Herod sent him back to Pontius Pilate, who again tried to reason with the Jews, and finally gave up and allowed Christ to be crucified, and all this was done so early that the crucifixion itself occurred about noon. The Hebrew day began at sunset. The night was divided into four watches of three hours each. The day, which began about 6 a.m. at that time of year, was divided into 12 hours, beginning at sunrise. John 19, verse 14, shows that the final hearing before Pilate ended a little before the sixth hour, which would be noon. While Luke 23, verse 44, shows that the actual crucifixion occurred soon after noon. So, to sum up the Jewish trials, we see that he was tried by a merely pretended court, a group of men who had no legal power to sit as the court in the darkness of night. No legal evidence against him was heard. He was given no opportunity to prepare a defense or to bring in witnesses in his defense. He was convicted and condemned to death on a false charge of blasphemy when his judges well knew that his words, whether they be true or false, were not blasphemy under their law, and he was murdered the same day without the reconsideration of the case which the law required. Furthermore, so long as they pretended to be a court, they were bound by the law. So when they convicted him by unanimous vote on the first ballot, their own law gave this the legal effect of a verdict of not guilty. No one can truthfully say that any Jewish trial proved Jesus Christ guilty of any sin or crime whatsoever. The essential core of Christianity is the fact that Jesus Christ brought salvation to sinners by himself paying the death penalty for their sins. He was able to die for their sins since he had none of his own to answer for. I have shown that even the corrupt mock trial given him by the Jews actually proved him innocent under the Jewish trial. Now let us consider the Roman trial, which followed. As soon as it was daylight, the great Sanhedrin met and planned to get the Romans to commit their judicial murder for them, trying thus just the blame, in typical Jewish fashion. They dragged Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. When Pilate asked what the charges were, John 18, verses 30 and 31 shows that the Jews were evasive and merely said, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. Pilate knew the Jews, and he would not be so easily taken in. So he replied, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. But they were determined to get others to do their murder for them. So they said, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was a lie, as they well knew for they were allowed to judge and punish under their own law, as Pilate had told them. And in fact, three years later, they did kill the martyr Stephen by stoning him to death, as the seventh chapter of the book of Acts relates. This was a form of execution used under Jewish law, so the Romans did not interfere with it. But stoning was a quick death, and they wanted the slow torture of crucifixion, which only the Romans could use. They therefore brought new charges against Jesus Christ before Pilate, abandoning as unproved the charges in which they had condemned him in the Jewish trial. But this was a formal charge of sedition against the Roman Empire, so Pilate had to hold a trial on it. Under Roman law, there were four elements or stages of a criminal trial. 
It began with the formal accusation or indictment, stating the crime which had been committed. Next came the examination, in which all evidence against the accused was heard, and the accused was required to answer the charges made. Then the accused made his defense, and he was allowed up to ten days' time to prepare for this if he needed it. And finally came the judgment. The Gospels show the complete Roman trial. First is the indictment in Luke 23, verses 1 to 5, which says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now the Jews knew that this was a false charge, for they had sent their agents to entrap him regarding paying the tribute money to Caesar. And Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22, Mark 12, verses 13 to 17, and Luke 20, verses 19 to 26, all record his answer. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. Probably Pilate's spies had reported this to him, for he was not much impressed by the Jewish lies. Luke continues, And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest. Then said Pilate to the high priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Here is the first legal ruling in the Roman trial. Pilate ruled that an accusation known to be false was not sufficient. Jesus was innocent. But the Jewish clamor for his murder became so threatening that Pilate proceeded with the trial. John 18 verses 33 to 38 records the examination, the defense, and the judgment. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? That is, do you really believe this, or are you just repeating their accusations? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the high priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world system. If my kingdom were of this world order, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from him. That is, you have already found me innocent of any crime in my religious teachings among the Jews, and I am not stirring up rebellion against the Roman Empire. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king, then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Although Pilate recognized the accusation as false, he had held a trial, heard both sides, and now gave his formal judgment. I find in him no fault at all. Justice is usually the last thing in the world the Jews want, and so it was then. So they began to riot, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. The situation was becoming dangerous so Pilate was enough of a politician to pass a hot potato to someone else to handle, as Luke 23, verses 5 to 12 records. Herod Antipas, governor of Galilee, was then in Jerusalem. So when Pilate heard that Jesus' home was in Galilee, he sent him to Herod for trial as one of Herod's subjects. Herod heard all the accusations against Jesus, and the charges were so obviously false that Jesus made no reply at all. Herod found nothing to the charges, so he merely mocked and ridiculed Jesus and sent him back to Pilate, who again tried to save him. Luke 23, verses 13 to 15 records it. And Pilate, 
When he had called together the high priests and rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching these things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done by him. Pilate tried to divert their hatred by ridiculing Jesus with a purple robe, a crown of thorns, and a reed for a scepter. He tried to arouse their pity by having Jesus cruelly flogged, but nothing but the cruelest murder would satisfy their hatred. The 19th chapter of John records the hopeless effort to save him. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate heard this saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat. Then he delivered him unto them to be crucified. And as Matthew 27 records, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And that was the only true thing they ever said. We have the record in every essential detail, showing that Jesus Christ was brought to trial on all the Jewish charges against him, that their accusations were proven false in their own great Sanhedrin, which they admitted by abandoning the charges in which they had tried him and bringing completely new charges before Pilate. Under Jewish law, the trial held before the great Sanhedrin resulted in the finding of innocence. There was another trial held in careful conformity to all rules of Roman law, which resulted in the verdict, I find in him no fault at all. Then there was a third trial held before Herod, who found nothing on which to convict him, for Herod merely ridiculed Jesus and sent him back to Pilate without ordering any kind of punishment. So the record stands, not only was Jesus Christ without any sin in the eyes of God, but even the courts of his worst enemies, could not find any crime or sin he had done. He does give us salvation, having died to pay the penalty of our sins, for he had no sin of his own to answer for. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is no mistaking from the word of God, the trial of Jesus, both three trials, all of them falsified against Christ, just today we see the same trials against Christians and yet to come in the very last days by the city of Jerusalem, the city of Antichrist. Remember, folks, the evidence is there. You be the judge and you be the judge as to whether you're in the right assembly. Rick Adams for the Deadly Experiment. Goodbye and Yahweh bless his life.